Hello, hello, hello guys, and welcome back to Joe's Ventures, and today we're going to be doing part 69 of our Planet Zoo Mod Spotlights, where we take a look at some of the wonderful mods people have been making, and compare them to their real-life fossil counterparts. And, um, yeah, we're going to be starting off today with a couple fishes, as per usual, by the wonderful Buff Zoo. Uh, we're going to have a look at the red Asian arowana, so we're going to have a look at the wonderful guys down here. So, there they are, little fellows. So, these guys aren't too dissimilar from the other Ar um, Asian arowanas. They, they're just a certain halotype, or morpho uh, morphotype, which means they're literally just uh, kind of their own kind of thing. And similar to these guys that live in Southeast Asia, I believe that the red colored, uh, super red or chili red as this one is here, is endemic to the, uh, only known from the upper part of the Campus River and west and the lakes nearby in Western Indonesia, so in Borneo. So that's generally where these guys are known from, but the general species is found all across like Indonesia, places like that. And these guys live in these kind of brackish water, um, or black water. Uh, slow moving wet, uh, wetlands and rivers and swamps as well where adults will feed on other fish and the uh, and the juveniles will feed on insects so um, similar to the other guys they get about 90 centimeters long or 35 inches in total length with these long bodies and these dragon like scales that look really really interesting on them and they also get the name the bony tongue fish because they have a bony tongue as you can see there and these guys often especially like there are relatives like the Asian or not the, these are Asian the South American arowana get the name monkey fish because they will shoot up and grab monkeys and things or and grab like whatever small animals they can get which is pretty cool and in terms of their reproduction uh, unlike most fish these guys reach sexual maturity at a later age of about three to four years old and um, the female probably produced uh, about 30 to 100 eggs, which are quite large. And the eggs are fertilized. Um, and then the parental care is really exhibited by the male. So that's uh, and the father will actually keep the babies in their mouth and uh, with mouth brooding. So both the fertilized eggs and the larvae will be um, brooded in the male's mouth until they're obviously big enough and ugly enough to survive. And in terms of uh, cultural impact, these guys are kind of sent, uh, meant to be like a prosperity uh, charm for good luck and such. And um, especially because they kind of look like a dragon with these large scales, it's kind of a good luck charm. But they are sadly considered endangered because of collection, also habitat loss and things like that. Especially the declining habitat. But um, being such a uh, expensive fish, I can go for thousands of US dollars. Uh, they've become really uh, important in captivity. Uh, the captive populations are important because obviously they breed them and farm them because you can make a lot of money off these arowana. And um, some uh, morphotypes are rarer than others. This um, the red golden one that I've covered before, and this is the red one. I believe to be more endangered than other types of um, or other morphs of arowana. But um, really, really cool fish here, and I'm glad that we got to see some variation there. So wonderful job there. I think this would be a great uh, to move on. So this is uh, Buff Zoo's and Leaf's um, mod here, and we've got another one done by Leaf and Buff Zoo. We have got the uh, large head hair tail. So another nice little fish going on here. So this is uh, also known as the belt fish. They're a member of the cutlass fish family, and they're abundant in tropical and temperate waters across the world. And um, as we'll get into it, their taxonomy is not really resolved because they could be a species complex, as I'll explain later. And um, these guys support major fisheries. So in terms of appearance, you can see how they have this like steely blue color, which is really amazing. That turns silvery gray when they die. They're generally semi-transparent and have a yellowish uh, tinge to them. And you can see they've got these quite long head bodies with this long head and also big eyes and big teeth. But they've also got this long tail as well and these long... Um, pectoral fin on the back there which is really really cool and um, in terms of size these guys can grow up to six kilograms in weight and about 2.34 meters or seven feet eight inches long in length but on average most will only get to about a half a meter to a meter long or one foot eight to three foot uh, three inches although they have been uh, seen regularly getting up to 1.5 to 1.8 meters or four foot to five foot eleven in uh, Australia 
So in terms of their range, they're found all across the world in tropical and temperate waters. They can be found uh, in the East Atlantic. They range from United Kingdom to uh, South Africa and in the Mediterranean. And then they'll be confound in Virginia and Cape Cod and Argentina as well and found in the Caribbean Sea and Mexico. And they're pretty much found all across the East Pacific from Colin Phelan, from southern california to peru and they're widespread in the indo pacific region as well from the red sea to south africa through the entire coast of australia or northern australia and fiji though they are absent from islands like hawaii which is a bit odd but also some populations are migratory and it seems these guys tend to prefer waters that are about 20 to 24 degrees celsius or 68 to 75 degrees fahrenheit and based on that fishing there they tend to live in waters mainly warmer than 40 degrees celsius or 57 degrees fahrenheit why and and catches tend to be poorer in these cooler waters um so uh these guys typically prefer shallow coastal regions over muddy bottoms but they sometimes will enter estuaries and have been recorded at depths from uh, 0 to 100, uh, 589 meters or 0 to 1932 feet and in most areas they typically range between 100 to uh, 400 meters so they typically typically don't dive that deep and they're actually mainly bethnopelagic so they're like deep open water and um, they actually may appear at the surface during the night so as I mentioned in terms of taxonomy, these, this is often considered a widespread species that lives across the world, but there's been, this is considered a species complex as well, so it's believed that there's potentially a lot of different species within it as well. So these species would be split into the Atlantic cutlass fish, the East Pacific cutlass fish, the Northwest Pacific or the Japanese cutlass fish, and the Indo-Pacific cutlass fish. So that's about four species in one, with um, some people arguing for splits, some people argue for subspecies, it's the taxonomy of that, it really needs to be sorted out. But um, yeah, really, really cool regardless. But um, juveniles are known to participate in um, dial vertical migration, so they rise during the night to feed on krill and small fish, and they return to the seabed during the day. And this movement pattern is kind of reversed in large adults, which feed mainly on fish. So these guys will kind of be active during the day and then uh, kind of go down at night. And um, these movement patterns kind of reverse on the large adults, but these guys are also known to eat shrimps and squid and are highly carnivorous with adults actually eating younger individuals as well. And they often can be found in these large dense schools. And um, spawning temperature depends on the uh, larvae and they prefer the warmer water, so about 21 degrees Celsius or 70 degrees Fahrenheit, and entirely absent in waters less than 16 degrees Celsius or 61 degrees Fahrenheit. So spawning is year round in tropical regions, but they generally uh, in colder regions can be between the spring and the summer and though a spawning season each female lay lays many thousand um, eggs uh, and they hatch after three to six days and in the sea of japan the most in individuals reach maturity about two years old but some are already mature after one year and the oldest age recorded for these guys is about 15 years so the large head uh hair tail is also a major commercial species with um, 1.3 million tons uh, fished in 2009 it was the sixth most important captured fish so they're pretty important to fisheries and it's typically caught through like bottom trawls or bench um, beach serenes so or there are a wide amount of other methods so um, uh, quite important fishery and caught on places such as China and Taiwan also uh, found pretty much everywhere they found these are fishing for them and they're actually pretty good eating apparently especially in Japan they're um, quite commonly found in sashimi and things like that and um, also grilled as well and um, actually pretty easy to debone as well so they're uh, quite a common uh, food fish yeah really really interesting looking fish as well such a cool animal so yeah we're gonna be moving on next we've got uh, by leaf and phonetic mods who we haven't seen in a long while but coming up with a banger we have got the arctic ground squirrel so the arctic ground squirrel is a species of ground squirrel that is native to the arctic and the subatlantic of north america and asia and um you can see these guys here they have like a beige tan coat and they have short faces dark tails and ears so that helps to conserve heat and they have white markings across their face as well uh, during the summer, they have typically red and yellow around their face. You can see this is like a summer coat that they've got going on here. But um, uh, as the, it falls, these red patches are typically replaced with a more of a silvery fur. 
and um, the average length for these guys is about 39 centimeters long or about 15 inches and since they go such dramatic changes during the seasons in body mass it's really hard to estimate an average size but an adult female can get close to about 750 grams or 26 ounces and males are generally about a 800, 900, uh, at the time, um, and they're about 100 grams heavier than females, so that's like 800 grams or so. Um, these guys, as I mentioned, uh, being the Arctic, they can be found in northern Canada, and they range from the Arctic Circle into northern British Columbia, and to the North uh, West Territories as well, and they can be found in Alaska and Siberia. So, um, these guys are native to that tundra, where they typically live on mountain slopes, river flanks, uh, lake shores, and tundra ridges in the tundra and they're very um they like to live in sandy store because it's easy to dig and it's very good to drain as well and they actually make shallow bu uh, burrows in areas where per uh, permafrost does not prevent digging as well and they typically inhabit that dry arctic tundra and open meadows in the most southern habitats of the species so let's talk about behavior so these guys live in the tundra and they're prey for animals like arctic fox red fox both species of uh, Canada, Canadian and Eurasian lynx, wolverines, eagles, and brown bears. And they're actually one of the few Arctic animals, along with their, um, with the marmots and also the little brown bat, that hibernate. And in summer, they typically go out and look for fruits and tubers and things like that and try to increase their body fat for hibernation. And by the late summer, these male ones will begin to store food in its burrow for the spring, and they will have edible food until the new vegetation has grown. And um, they're typically, their burrows are lined with muxels here, lichens, and leaves, which is pretty cool. And they're actually quite vocal as well, um, through vocal and physical means. They make chirps and things, and that can, different chirps can mean different things for different predators. And that's pretty interesting as well. So in terms of their diet, they hibernate, uh, well, in terms of hibernation, they hibernate from uh, over winter, from early August to late April in adult females, and late September to early April in adult males where they typically reduce their body, body temperatures from about 37 degrees Celsius or 99 degrees Fahrenheit to as little as minus 3 or 27 degrees Fahrenheit. And during hibernation, they can let these bodies go down, slow down, and then they can have their heartbeat go at one beat per minute. So it allows them to cool down and then they don't use so much energy. And then kind of that they actually will, um, in the absence of um, ice, Nuclear tours, uh, they can pronounce that. The body fluids can actually remain uh, liquidized in the supercool state, which is pretty cool. They have some really interesting adaptations, and that could apply to um, allow to better preserve human organs to be able to use for transplants, which is really interesting. And um, the terms of diet, these guys would typically eat things like grasses, sedges, mushrooms, willows, stalks, um, things like that as well. And they'll also eat insects and carrion, so they will eat like caribou and mice and things, as well as juvenile squirrels. And they've been seen to carry food back to their den in their cheeks, which is really cool. And their dens are actually really, really um, interesting. We'll watch them go down there. Where's it gonna pop out? Let's see where they go. So um, often a lot of paleontologists, as a side fact, will actually use their burrows uh, to like have a look at the general uh, plants at the time it was living, so like a fossilized or preserved um, nest of an Arctic ground squirrel that tells you kind of what plants were around it and what kind of habitats. Oh, yeah. So it's a really good way to tell how um, the climate has changed, which is very interesting. So yeah, during the mating season, the males will get quite aggressive for each other with their mating rights. And um, let's have a look at some of the cute little babies as we talk about them. So um, these guys typically live in individual burrows and mating will occur from mid-April to mid-May, which depends on the latitude. And, and after that winter hibernation, uh, the males will obviously fight with each other and the females, uh, for the females and the litters are typically sired by multiple males. So you might have lots of half brothers and sisters even in one, um, um, one litter. And the gestation is approximately about 25 days and the litter will have like range from five to 10 and they'll be like 10 grams and hairless. And after six weeks or so, the pups are weaned and they're followed by rapid growth as they prepare for the upcoming winter. So in terms of their conservation, uh, there's been no really estimates on their size and they're considered least concern. But obviously with issues such as climate change, things like that, it might not be like that for long. But yeah, really, really wonderful little guys. Fanatic really did a wonderful job with these uh, cool little guys here, these little brown squirrels. Really, really cute. So next we're going to move on to, uh, we've got a couple monkeys. So this next one was done by Monsoon and Leaf. Uh, we have got the 
They'll cause Langur, which is a critically endangered species, which is awesome. Well, not awesome that it's in da uh, critically endangered, but awesome to see that represented in the game. But these guys are actually typically quite a bit larger than their relatives, and in other respects they have a similar appearance. Uh, adults will typically measure between 57 to 62 centimeters or 22 to 24 inches in head to body length, with a tail that's between 82 and 88 millimeters, or or 3.2 to 3.5 inches long. Oh, I don't think that's right. Um, males uh, weigh between 7.5 and 10.5 kilograms, or 17 to 38 pounds, uh, with females being slightly smaller, weighing between 6 to 9 kilograms, or 14 to 20 pounds. And you can see their um, color is predominantly black, but they almost have these little uh, white stops around their rump and their lowers. They almost look like they've got pants on, which is really, really cute. And um, they also have this crest that's on the crown here that seems to be quite a bit taller and narrower than a lot of other species of langur. Still really, really cool. And um, these guys are endemic to Vietnam, so they could be only found in Vietnam. And they're found in a 6,000 kilometer squared area in the provinces of Nhe Binh, Hanan, Hoi Binh, um, and Hai Tay, and places like that in the north of the country. And um, the largest surviving population lives in the Vang Long uh, Nature Reserve, where they inhabit um, open forests up to elevations of 328 meters or 1,076 feet, with lots of uh, limestone terraces and things like that. Really, really wonderful guys here. So these guys are diurnal, so they spend most of their, uh, often spending their day sleeping in the limestone canes, and although they sleep on the bare rock surfaces, no caves available. Uh, these guys are also fo uh, folivores, so they feed typically on vegetation, like foliage, such as fruits, seeds, and flowers. And they've actually been seen eating a wide variety of flowers, which indicate they appearance, um, they tend to be more depend on the limestone than the rest of the diet, so it just seems to be what happened there. Um, and also previous decades, it seems that the Delcors Langueur was reported in living in quite large troops of up to 30 individuals with a mix of male and females, although single male groups are more common, and there's some variation within that. In more recent years, uh, it's become much smaller since the populations are generally much smaller, and it can be up to 16, with males defending their troop from the outsiders for standing on these outcrops. And despite living in these forests, they're, they're actually primarily terrestrial, uh, terrestrial, and they only occasionally venture into the trees. And they swing with their hands by traveling through trees and use their tails to balance and things like that. So they tend to walk around a lot more. In terms of reproduction, we'll have a look at the babies while we'll talk about the reproduction. So um, these females uh, will give birth to a single uh, young after a gestation period of about 170, 200 days. And they, as you can see, they're born with this orange fur and they're considered precocial. So they have strong arms and their actually eyes are open. And the fur will begin to turn black after about four months of age. And they're weaned from their mother about 90 to 21 months old, where the mother is likely to breed again. However, uh, the full adult co coat is not really achieved until about three years of age, with females reaching sexual maturity about four years old, and males at five years old, the life expectancy on average is 20 years or so. And the populations of these guys have sadly rapidly declined. As of 2006, only 19 were known, and it's believed to be uh, it's even more declining between 1990 and 2004, about 20%. And their class is critically endangered, and their primarily threat is for them as hunting of traditional medicine and also loss of habitat and development of tourism as well. And it's actually believed to be, as of 2010, less than 250 of these animals alive, uh, or at least in the wild, and there's about 19 of them in captivity. So they're on the dire straits, uh, sadly, but really wonderful animals. Hope they don't go extinct. Really, really beautiful langur. And Mo uh, Monsoon did a wonderful job of reconstructing and showing, giving us this really nice mod. So next we've got one that was made by Just Leaf this time. Leaf always doing a wonderful job. We have got the common marmoset. So let's have a look at the common marmoset right over here. So these cute little guys. They're also known as the white tuft marmoset because of these white tuft. These guys are a new world monkey that live in the northeastern coast of Brazil. Uh, though they've been introduced into other areas, such as uh, considered an invasive species, since they might dilute the pop genetic populations of species such as the uh, buffy uh, tuft marmoset as well, and they prey on eggs and stuff. And um, these guys are typically very small, but they have a long tail. May males and females are pretty much the same size, with males being slightly larger. The males will have an average height of about 188 millimeters or 7 inches, and females about 
uh, a little bit smaller, 185. Males will weigh about 256 grams or 9 ounces at, on average, and females weigh uh, 8 grams on ounces. I mean, eight, um, 236 grams or 8 ounces. Um, that's what I meant. And you can see they've got this cool multicolored um, pelt with like grays and stuff, and also this white as well with these white ears, where they get the other name, the white haired marmoset. And um, pretty cool guys. So these guys are really native to East Central Brazil, but have been introduced to other areas and live within uh, cities, such as Rio de Janeiro and uh, Buenos Aires. And they've been introduced to these areas. They typically live in forest habitats, but they have been seen inhabiting savanna forests and riverine habitats. And they actually do quite well in these areas, so it's probably helpful that um, that these guys are doing well in those areas, since so there's been a lot of deforestation. In terms of these guys, they've got these claw-like nails and incisor sides and um, got specializations. They mainly eat plants, um, extracts, and insects. They typically feed things, uh, feed on things like gum, resin, things like that, and they use their claws to hang onto the trees. But they'll also eat lots of insects as well. And um, another thing they'll also eat is lots of fruits, uh, small lizards, tree frogs, birds' nests, uh, birds' eggs and nestlings, and smaller mammals. And they've even been seen to compete with fruitful birds, uh, such as parrots and toucans and woolly opossums. So they're pretty generous, which really helps them become so common. So in terms of their socialization, they typically live in stable extended groups with only a few members around to breed. These members uh, groups can be quite big, up to about 15 members. Uh, but more typical number is about nine. And they usually have about one to two breeding females in this group, a fee breeding male and his offspring and then their adult relatives, that'd be that their parents or siblings. And the females in the group tend to be closely related, but the males less so. The males do not mate with breeding females to which they are related. And the marmosets usually leave their native groups when, before they become adults, uh, when they become adults, in contrast to other primate species which leave at adolescence. So we don't know too much about that, but groups will change all the time as new individuals come in and some leave. It's always to try and keep genetic diversity, which is pretty cool. And dominance through these groups is kind of the breeding male and the female tend to share dominance and between two breeding females one is more dominant though and they usually are kind of the top boss so the two breeding pairs are kind of the top boss and dominance is maintained through like postures vocalizations and behaviors and things like that to make sure everyone knows who's top dog in the group pretty much so in terms of reproduction these guys have a very very complicated breeding system as we'll find i don't think we have babies here because they're too small but um they're very, very complex. They were thought to be monogamous, like a lot of other species of marmosets, but these guys have been seen, uh, observed, um, using polygamy and polyandry as well, but most matings are monogamous. And ev even in groups with two breeding females, these subordinate female often mates with males from other groups, and the subordinate female will just, usually does not give birth to fit offspring. So mating with extra group males allows the females to find potential mates in the future and the females that mate successfully but use their lung move on to other groups and they may gain that dominant breeding position so that helps them raise their babies better. So uh, their breeding individual needs to move to other member uh, needs other members to help raise the young so the other members of the group will help take care of the young so the females can breed and do other things which is pretty cool and um, when the conditions are right to breed the adult female will breed regularly for the rest of her life and um, the females usually flick their tongues the males uh, to solicit mating so they go flick their tongues which is pretty interesting uh, the gestation period for these guys lasts about five months and um, females are ready to breed after 10 days after giving birth and five months pass between each um, patrician and they can give birth about twice a year and they normally give birth or commonly give birth to non-identical twins as well and because of this, females are under stress during pregnancy and lactation, which need the help of the other families and members. And these infants typically cling to their mother's back, so do not let go until the first and for the first few weeks of their life. And they, after that, they become very active, and they get uh, and they usually weaned after about three months of age. In about five months, they become juveniles, and they have more interactions with everyone other than their parents. And then another set of infants may be born at this time, and the young the young from the last one will breed with them, uh, not breed with them, play with them. And uh, marmosets will become sub-adults at about 9 to 14 months old, and act like the adults, and go through puberty. And when they become 15 months old, they are sexually mature, and they reach their adult size. They don't breed until they are dominant, or move on to another group. And in terms of communication, as I mentioned, they have lots of different communications to uh, obviously show dominance and also alert others of predators. So they will even frown, they will stare, they will use all sorts of physical and um, 
audible cues to try and communicate what they mean to each other. It's like thrills as well. They'll have like uh, tisks as well and all sorts of different sounds to that they serve to keep groups together, defend territories, locate missing members, things like that. So it's quite common. And um, the common marmoset has re uh, been considered a quite common species and not currently threatened. So it's, I believe it's considered uh, least concerned by the IUCN. Yes, it is. But um, it has kind of become a issue because its habitat is degraded quite fast and they're actually quite popular as pets as well so they're often captured and traded as pets and they can be difficult to tr control so often once people get them they're either killed or um, get abandoned because people just don't know how to take care of them uh, but these guys have also been used for medical experiments especially in Europe uh, more so the United States where they've been used as model organisms to study things like obesity reproduction Im immunology endocrinology things like that and um, a little fact um, in 2014, uh, a female uh, common uh, common marmoset was actually the first non-human primate to have her whole genetic code sequence, or complete genome sequence, which was about um, two uh, 2.26 um, billion base pairs, I think, like that, uh, and it's and it's about slightly a little bit smaller than humans, but more than orangutans mm -hmm. as well. So that's pretty cool think how like genetics work really awesome little yeah. guy that leaf did a wonderful job bringing this guy in a big fan and next we've got another mod from um monsoon and leaf we have got here the mountain yala so we have a look at the wonderful male here these guys um also known as the balbok they're an um antelope that has found the high altitude woodlands of a small part of ethiopia and they're a monotypic uh species so they have no such species and they were just first described by English naturalist uh, Richard Lecture in uh, 1910. In terms of size, the males typically get about 120 to 135 centimeters tall, or about 30, 47 to 53 inches, while females are a bit smaller at about 90 to 100 centimeters, or 35 to 39 inches at the shoulder, with males weighing between 180 to 300 kilograms, or 400 to 660 pounds, and females weighing a little bit lighter at about 150 to 200 kilograms, or 330 to 440 pounds. And they have this really interesting greater brown coat, as you can see here, which has these uh, light stripes. Ooh, came out of nowhere. These light stripes here with spots, and the males tend to be quite a bit darker. And you can see the females are like a little bit more orange over there. Whoa. Really, really interesting. And they also have a short, dark crest of about 10 centimeters long or 3.9 inches going down their back of hair, which really looks cool. And only the males really possess these large horns. And um, these guys are quite elusive, and they typically live in small groups four to five individuals and the males are not territorial normally and these guys are primarily browsers so they spend most of their time uh, browsing but they will graze occasionally with uh, females mating at about two years of age uh, and f males become sexually mature at this time and the station for these guys lasts about um, eight to nine months with a single calf being born uh, as you can see here single little calf here how cute and the lifespan lasts about uh, 15 to 20 years so to get a little bit about the taxonomy of these guys, these guys are actually not, not related to your normal Nala. They're actually more closely related to greater kudus and bongos, as uh, evidenced by a lot of genetic evidence, which is really, really interesting. So as I mentioned, these guys are not territorial, so they have large range ranges, things like that, preyed upon by predators uh, like leopards. And um, they start, um, gestation lasts for about eight to nine months, with peaking about September to November with calves, uh, remaining in cover for the first few weeks of their birth and the calves will remain close to their mother for their first two years or so of their life and the, and the young people may get pregnant again but then the young males will mature at about two years old and challenge others and be driven out of the herd and um, in terms of their distribution they're typically found in a small habitat of around a mountain woodlands of about 3,000 to 3,400 meters or 9,800 to 11,200 feet where they typically feed on things like um, African juniper things like that and um, all those kind of woodlands they like to live in. These guys are threatened a lot by um, hunting and stuff like that. So the threats include illegal hunting, encroachment by livestock, uh, predation by dogs, um, expansion into their uh, habitats as well, uh, and a lot of those issues like that. And that's why they've been considered uh, endangered by the IUCN. So there's legal protections for these species and there's been parks to set up. And about the 1960s, the population was estimated to be about um seven to eight thousand 
though perhaps up to 12,000, but they took kindly sharp to about 2,000 to 4,000 in the 1980s, and they're even decreasing now, and are feared to be extinct in some parts of their range, but there's potentially a few that could survive. I believe the estimates now are, today are probably like less than a thousand or so, so they're considered endangered, and their relationship with humans is that they influences the mountain yala as well as the yala on their culture, so they have like um, different brands they call them like yala motors, things like that, with businesses and things like that, and often have been hunted for food by um, African tribes as well. But yeah, really, really cool animal here, and I'm glad um, Monsoon did a wonderful job uh, with these guys. Really came out well. They really don't look like Nualas that much, but you can see why they looked vaguely similar with the colors, and finding out that they're not that closely related is really interesting. I think that's really cool. But yeah, Monsoon Leaf did a wonderful job yet again. And next, we've got this next one's done by Jinger Toast and Leaf. We have got the Marbled Polecat. So really cute little guys here. So these guys are a small mammal that is their own genus called Volmera, which are a small little mustelid. And um, these guys typically range in body lengths from about 39 to 35, oh no, 29 to 35 centimeters or with head to body. And they are quite small. They have these short muzzles with large ears and they have this kind of uh, really interesting where they get the name marble. They've got this like yellowish to orange color with um, darker yeah, uh, yeah. colors mixed through it, so they look kind of marbled, which really gives them their markings, along with some darker faces and uh, white to accentuate that, so that's pretty cool. Um, females would typically weigh between 295 to 600 grams, or 10 to 21 pa uh, ounces, and males from 320 to 715, so 11 to 25 ounces. They're really cool. So in terms of the habitat, they're native to uh, southeastern Europe from Russia to China, so they range from Bulgaria, Turkey, Romania, Jordan, uh, Israel, up to places such as uh, China, Mongolia, Kazakhstan, and even being recorded in Egypt, which is pretty interesting. And they typically prefer habitats that are open, uh, semi-desert, uh, rocky areas, uh, also open deserts, steppe country, scrub forests, but they avoid mountainous regions. And in terms of their behavior and ecology, these guys are most active during the morning and the evening. And um, their eyesight is weak, but they have a really great sense of smell, where they have all sorts of different vocalizations to communicate with, like, uh, grunts and shrieks and calls and stuff. They are solitary, but they typically have an extensive home range of about uh, 0 0.5 to 0 0.6 kilometers. And they typically stay in a shelter at that time. And when alarmed, they will raise, their, uh, raise up on its legs and arch their back to kind of like make themselves look bigger and scary and also hiss. And they also have pineal glands that allows them to shoot uh, a foul smelling substance at predators when they feel in danger. And um, in terms of, uh, they will typically use, uh, when they dig, they'll dig out earth with its forelegs and anchor itself with its shin and hind legs. And um, they actually use their teeth to put out obstacles such as roots as well. And they actually will use the uh, burrows of other species such as brown squirrels and other rodents like gerbils and in the winter they will line these dens with grass as well. So in terms of reproduction they typically mate from about March to early June and their mating calls are most often heard with low rumpling sounds as well and their gestation can be quite variable so it can be between 243 and 327 days and typically uh, Pearl nutrition has been observed in like late January to mid March, and actually to play to implantation is another thing that allows them to um, better control their time of birth for their cubs, um, so they can give birth when prey is abundant. And typically, a litter size can be about four to eight cubs, and only females take care of the young, with the cubs opening their eyes at about 38 to 40 days of age, and they're weaned from 50 to 54 days, and they leave their mother about 61 to 68 days of age. And in terms of their diet, uh, polecats eat a variety of things. They eat a lot of ground squirrels, other small rodents, um, hares, birds, lizards, fish, frogs, snails, insects, as well as fruits and grass. And they've actually been reported taking um, small poultry, such as pigeons and chickens. So pretty much anything that's small enough for them to take down, they will eat. And um, in terms of their conservation, they're considered a vulnerable species by the IUCN because their population has reducted by at least 30% in the pre previous 10 years. And in 1996, they were considered a species of less concern, but it's thought that these population declines could be happening because of habitat loss and also because of the reduction of prey done by rodenticides. And um, data has revealed that west to east is actually um, a gradual decrease in diversity within the polecats. So that gives location as a factor to diversify in polecats. And um, 
It actually seems that their range formation of the species rather than climate change. So that's interesting. A really, really wonderful little guys. Ginger Toast did a wonderful job. And moving on to another cool little carnivore, also done by Ginger Toast and Leaf. Um, we have got the European Wildcat. So let's see if we can have a look at you here. Wonderful little fellow here. So these guys are a small wildcat species native to um, Europe, Scotland, Turkey, and the Caucasus. And they also inhabit forests from the Iberian Peninsula, Italy, Central to Eastern Europe, to the Caucasus. And... Um, you can see their fur here is kind of like a brownish tinge and grayish with stripes. They look like your normal house cat, but they're definitely not your normal house cat. With uh, a forehead inside with this like brushy tails and things like that. They can reach to a head to body length of about 65 uh, centimeters or 26 inches. With a 34 centimeter tail or about 30 and a half inch tail. And weigh up to about 7 kilograms. So in France and Italy, these guys are typically considered nocturnal, but active during the day, and they feed a lot on lagomorphs and rodents, so those small things, but also ground-dwelling birds. So they are closely related to your normal house cat, and are believed to have split from your house cat, I believe. Um, let's see if we find... They've split from other cats, typically like around the past like 34,000 years. Um, especially in other areas in Felis as well. And turn the characteristics, you can see brownish gray colors and brownish gray colors like that. Really nice uh, little mod here, I think. And um, uh, the distribution, they typically live in like broadleaf and mixed forests and they avoid areas that are cultivated in, by settlements. And their northmost population lives in Scotland and have been extirpated from England and Wales, which sucks. Uh, there's actually two uh, disconnected populations in France as well, one on the um, northeastern side, and that extends through Luxembourg, Germany, and Belgium. And there's another one that's connected to the Pyrenees, so there needs to be some more introductions that way. In the Netherlands, they were just, uh, recorded in 1999 and um, in 2004, and it's believed that these individuals have dispersed from Germany. So there's believed to be some animals actually dispersing again, so that's really cool. So in terms of their breeding uh, and eco behavior and ecology, I mean, these guys typically hunt at night and they're typically uh, in undisturbed sites. They'll hunt during the day, but in France and Italy, areas where they're most disturbed, they'll hunt at night. And um, in terms of the diet, they pretty much eat whatever they can get their mouths around, such as small rodents like voles and um, uh, brown rats and hamsters, things like that. But they also eat like martens, uh, weasels, and even fawns of red deer really variable and also depends on what areas they live in they'll eat different things depending on different areas of europe they live in and um, in terms of conservation efforts they're mostly rare where they're found now because of legal protection uh, they're still shot because people mistake them for feral cats sadly and also there's been the risk of interbreeding from domestic uh, cats which helps um, d which diminishes the wild population's distinctiveness and also could dis uh, not help their survival since they're obviously domesticated um, also another big thing has been loss of habitat and also this hybridization and um, there's lots of conservation efforts going in to protect these guys such as reintroduction efforts um, trying to create corridors for these guys to spread into and other species as well and also Scotland the Scotland wildcat is kind of considered in danger now and has been deemed no longer viable but there seems to be efforts to try and uh, bring captive uh, conservation programs and reintroduce cats to the wild so there is efforts to try and protect these guys and I think they're very, very cute little guys, if I do say so myself. Really wonderful little mod here. Ginger Toast and Leaf did a wonderful job with this one. And last and most certainly not least, we have got the Australian Sea Lion. So there's the female. We'll have a look at the male here. Wonderful guy here. So this one was done by Nora Walbert, who often does a lot of really nice mods. So these guys, the Australian Sea Lion, are a species of sea lion and the only endemic pinniped uh, to Australia. These guys are considered endangered with a population of about 14,000 individuals. Uh, they've considered them as a needed special protection. And um, they're distributed across like Western and South Australia with lots of breeding colonies around that area. Places such as the Point Labbit in South Australia as a lot of colonies. Uh, but the breeding range has been constricted as um, their populations have fell. There have um, been some extinct breeding colonies in places like the Bar Strait. And um, there's even some near Perth and Albany, but um, hosted these now extinct colonies. So as potentially their numbers go up, they will re-establish um, re in these areas where they used to breed. In terms of communication, uh, mothers and pups are uh, frequently separated throughout nursing and thus have lots of uh, 
um, different calls to communicate with each other and things like that so mother doesn't lose the um, sound of her baby and then males ones have actually been observed um, doing three different calls so they'll have a barking call a bleating call and a female like call and which is call type made by males is the barking call so that allows them to kind of like say oh, I'm the big man on the block here don't mess with me which is pretty interesting um, also these guys are considered opportunistic ethnic feeders so they pretty much feed on whatever they can uh, samples of um, their feces suggest they eat things like fish squid cuttlefish sharks include the Port Jackson shark and um, lobsters and little penguins as well uh, which is interesting and they'll eat a lot of these species especially um, depending where they live these different different animals will eat different amounts of certain foods and in terms of predators they're occasionally um, eaten by adults skinny get eaten by great white sharks and killed by other animals such as stingrays but pups are vulnerable to attack from a lot of smaller shark species as well so really really cute and in terms of their breeding behavior as of 2020 it's been identified that there are about uh, 66 breeding colonies across southern and western Australia and um, these have kind of been um, observed since because they're an endangered species it's been monitored by people there's um the four largest colonies on like kangaroo island and stuff like that and i believe the population is estimated to be about 2432 on these 50 islands in 1990 with another few breeding colonies recorded but it seemed to be going up now so that's really good the breeding cycle of these guys is unusual within pinnipeds since they have a 16 to 18 month cycle which is not synchronized between the colonies so um it shows that the um kind of there's been a shift forward in time to 13 days uh, every 18 months or so so the duration of the breeding season can be between five and seven months and it's been recorded up to nine months in some areas such as seal bay and bulls typically do not have these fixed territories and um the males will often fight the other males at a very young age to establish their hierarchy to get to the female within uh estrus so they can breed with her and have pups the females will come to season for about 24 hours within 7 to 10 days after she's given birth to a new pup and she will often look after the new pup and generally fights off the previous season's pups to allow them to suckle from her and um, many uh, many of these guys have been known to kill the young sadly but probably to kill something so cute and they also p participate in allo parental care so that means an adult may adapt, adopt another pup or a pup of another um, which is pretty interesting and this might take place if the original parent have died or separated them from example and this behavior is common and seen in other species such as elephant and fathead minnows as well uh, which is pretty cool but uh, in the population 2010 their population was estimated to be about 14,750 and it seems like their population had dropped uh, by 2014 to an estimated six and a half thousand and it's been continuing to uh, decrease for whatever reason and it seems to be naturally disadvantaged when they're compared to the other pinnipeds because they have a long and complicated breeding cycle that allows them to be outcompeted by um, other species of seals and also um, high fidelity sites of females and the high mortality rates which makes them more vulnerable to extinction but there has seems to be some efforts to put into that as well and they've actually been seen um, may exhibit defensive behavior including biting to people so they're not really often kept in captivity um, during uh, mainly that 1960s and 70s or the 1920s there was large-scale hunting of these seals like a lot of other species for their coats and things as well but we don't know how many were there were before the uh, hunting but we just know there's a lot more now a lot less now and um, there's been uh, reports of illegal shootings as well of different seals uh, especially recently there was one at balls beach kangaroo island or bales beach that was a male uh, sea lion was shot also shark fisheries have been a big thing because people fish for the sharks and they can decrease their populations their long lactation period as well has been another issue because of their uh, mortality since they have a high uh, a proportionally higher mortality rate than a lot of other species of sea lions which is pretty interesting but um their conservation management they've been a lot of their habitats protected and they're listed vulnerable uh, by the ICN as well or endangered uh, and the global population is considered to be decreasing sadly but um, there's been participating captive breeding programs with um, there have been 41 pups born and raised in captivity since 1981 and they've been kept, kept in uh, aquaria as well and um, also lots of fisheries have been uh, protecting areas and trying to create ways so that seals don't get caught in their um, the nets and stuff and things like that 
But um, in terms of their ecology, they tend to, uh, they're really important because often their feces and stuff like that really help with the nutrient cycle. So they poop in the water and then uh, that's obviously good fertilizer for a lot of these smaller uh, uh, algae and things like that. And um, that's really, really important. They also have strong site fidelity. So they will often travel there in hard weather as well. And um, so it's very easy to track them as, in that regard. But I really hope their populations are doing well. Sadly, they are endangered, but I hope that um, there's been more efforts and I think there's clearly gonna be more efforts to try and protect them. Really, really wonderful guy here. So uh, thank you for show, letting us show you off, Grace. We'll have a look at the mail before we go. So yeah. We got in a wonderful uh, mod spotlight today. We've done that. Wonderful job. Some really wonderful species showing up today. Thank you for Narwhaler, Monsoon, Leaf, and Phonetic Mods, and all these guys for these wonderful mods. So I think this will be a great place to end the video. So yeah, I uh, really, really, really hope you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe. Always remember to hit the little bell icon to get notified of anything. So yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed this video. Hope you guys like and subscribe, and bye bye